my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ and friends. When I consider the three readings for today, I tried to look for a common theme, and I came to a conclusion that it is actually the problem of pride in contrast to the glory of God. Now, in the seminal readings, which we are doing at the moment, we are reminded of this pride of soul, just focusing on himself, in contrast to David, whose focus was on God. In Isaiah, God tells us, to this man will I look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. Now there is no room for pride in that attitude. Now in our Matthew reading, Jesus condemns those cities who didn't repent and were full of pride. So it is actually a common theme that runs through our readings for this day. Now, the definition of pride is rather interesting. It simply means exercising self-esteem or arrogance. Now, we must say and emphasize that in the presence of Almighty God, there is no room for any pride. We can ask why. Why is this so? I submit to you that there are two main reasons why this is. Firstly, we are created beings. We would not exist without God. The great command is, let us make man. Then secondly, the verdict after the fall, just thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. I suggest that these are the two main reasons that there is no room for pride as far as man is concerned. Now, when we ponder the book of Job, this is, I'm sure, basically the key message. Now, after all the discussions and arguments, we might say, between Job and his friends, which are interesting, and quite useful, God steps in and asks him questions. Now, Job had wished to question God. But who is any man to question the Almighty? Instead, God will question Job. The questions that follow are all about God's mighty creation. God asked Job about the founding of the earth and its proportions. He's asking about the elements and the weather. We just had the recent floods. We all know how powerless man is when the elements are raging. Can Job control the planets and the way they affect the earth? Can Job provide the needs for the lion and the raven? Did Job create the strength of the horse? Job has no answer to any of these questions. There are questions, brothers and sisters, that demonstrate, I would say, the tiny limits of man's understanding and the great depths of his ignorance, we might say, in comparison to God's eternal power and wisdom. Job had to learn that man is only a very small part of creation. He's a piece of clay in the hands of the potter. There can be no room for pride. Now, the, the tragedy in the Garden of Eden was basically a shift from focusing on God 
to focus on with serpent reasoning. Should God have said? So it was a shift of focus to self because the serpent's reasoning was he will be as gods, knowing good and evil. Is this not the tragedy of mankind? A shift in focus. The pride of man has been the problem ever since. Exercising self-esteem. Now this is all summarized in the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Now is this not, brothers and sisters, the, the story of the Bible? Is it not the story of God's book? The story of losing focus on God and focusing on man? We all remember the me generation in the age in which we live. Now we see this in the offspring of Adam and Eve. Cain was wroth that Abel's sacrifice was acceptable to God. We know he brought the wrong sacrifice, but that's not the real issue, I think. He was annoyed and wroth because the focus was on him and not on God. He was angry because God, God was not in his mind. What Cain should have done, I suggest, he should have asked why his sacrifice was not acceptable, but he didn't. So he carried on with focusing on himself, and we know it led to the first murder. And this, brothers and sisters, is how the story continues. We hear in Genesis 4, Lamech's speech, Rather interesting. I'm going to read it for you. Edda and Zillah, hear my voice. Wife of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me. Even a young man for hurting me. Now where is the emphasis? It's on those pronouns. Hear my voice. My speech, I have killed, wounding me, bursting me. So where's the emphasis? Where's the focus? We see it in the days of Noah. They have lost focus. Noah was the only one walking with God. We see it in Sodom, losing focus. Only Lot remained. We hear it in the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. Come, let us build ourselves a city. Let us make us a name for ourselves. Same like Lamech. God is not in the picture. It's rather interesting when you consider the building of the EU. That building has the shape of the Tower of Babel. So nothing has changed. The focus is still, still the same. It's on man. And this is, brothers and sisters, how it continues. We hear the voice of Nebuchadnezzar walking in his palace. His words are as follows, is this not great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the house of my majesty? Again, let's note the emphasis. Full of pride. So we only have to let history of man pass before our eyes. It is always the same, driven 
by power and pride. I just paged recently, just for interest sake, through the Atlas of World History, rather an interesting atlas. What struck me that this, it's always power and pride that is the problem. It comes out very clearly in some of the headings of those articles there. Just maybe just to mention a few. The world on the eve of European expansion was one big section. And it comes out very clearly there that that expansion was just power and pride. The rise of the United States to world power, same. It's the power and pride which was the main reason for this. Rather interesting, Russian expansion in Europe and Asia is a big section. A thought of present situations isn't the same. Power and pride. I personally think it's very clear. You might disagree, I don't know. Is that Putin is a Russian imperialist. He has a revived Tsarist empire in mind, I'm sure. That's power and pride. Hopefully this brings in more results in our understanding of God's holy word. Now, when we think about God's people, Israel, his chosen people, now at the very outset of Israel's national life, God reminds them that he is not the creation of man. That's very interesting. But man, the creation of God. That was emphasized. So brothers and sisters, on the basis of this fact, will God accept man's worship? He will not accept man's worship based on philosophy and other things. And this really is the purpose of the law given to Israel. Now, be ye holy, for I am holy. I am Yahweh your God. It's a constant reminder and leaves no room for self-importance or pride in God's law. So the whole purpose of the sacrifices was a reminder of man's sinfulness and God's holiness. And that's how we should continue. So brothers and sisters, it's very clear that God hates pride. And we must learn to hate what God hates. Pride is, is serious, and God is opposed to a pride. Maybe just a reminder, Brother Barry just read one verse which I ought to go down here. I just want to recite a few of these interesting verses which we find mainly in Proverbs. Proverbs 11, when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly comes wisdom. Genesis, uh, Proverbs 16, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Rather strong verse. Proverbs 16, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. In uh, Proverbs 6, when there are seven things listed which God hates, it's rather interesting that pride is the very first one mentioned. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, that was Perry's verse, pride 
and arrogancy. Only by pride comes contention. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. The high look and the proud heart is sin. And this is how it carries on. We could mention lots more, but that's a thing that God hates. Now we know that the prophets, the prophets were sent to God's chosen people to remind them of the problem of pride. We have it very often in the prophecies. Just a few examples there. Isaiah 25. He shall bring down their pride. Woe to the crown of pride is the prophet's message. After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah. Thy terribleness have deceived thee, and the pride of thine heart is the prophet's message to God's people. Ezekiel has the warning is pride and fullness of prayer. Now we know that the opposite to pride is humility. Now humility, I suggest, is critical in receiving God's grace. Now it's also very important, I'm sure, it's important to realize what humility is not. It is not denying gifts and grace God has given us. It is using what God has given us for his glory. That is true humility. Then the emphasis is on God and not on ourselves. So in these closing days of Gentile times, brothers and sisters, the emphasis of man is on himself and not on God. You just have to think of the world at the moment. There's no mention of God in the Humanist manifesto, whatsoever, not once. Now, the biblical meaning of humility has the following meaning. I'm sure we know that. It can mean looking down or browbeating or to depress, abase self, chase self, deal hardly. We know how often the word tells us to be of a humble mind. So if we want to practice humility, it simply means to press down and deal hardly with ourselves. Now, thinking about pride and humility, I try to examine myself with the, with the following questions which we might, might all do this morning, to see whether I battle with pride. Maybe some of these questions. Do I have a hard time putting my mistakes behind me? Do I tend to feel maybe envious or jealous? Or maybe sometimes even critical? If I see other people who are better off than I am, who are honored more than I am, is that coming up in me? Jealousy or envy or something? Do I only occasionally think about or recognize that all I am or have comes from God? Do I only do this occasionally? Do I often feel ungrateful? Do I feel that there is not much I can learn from other people? I have a hard time admitting that I'm wrong. Am I easily angered or offended? Do I sometimes, in an exhortation, 
think that I hope Gregor so and so and Sister so and so is listening. Anyway, that's just personal things which we might all ask ourselves. So, brothers and sisters, may we at all times remember that we are just an ashes. May we not lose focus, but keep our eyes firmly fixed on the sovereignty of our God and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have come again this morning to this table, the bread and the wine before us, symbols of the perfect sacrifice. <clears throat> Here we see the Son of God in full recognition of the power and sovereignty of his Father to do his will. There is no pride in him. But perfect obedience to conquer our sinful nature. We see it in the answers to his temptations, the answers he gave. There's no pride in that. We see it in the answer that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to the man who asked him a question. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life was the question. And Jesus stopped him. He said, no, don't call me good. Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one. That is God. Very interesting answer of Jesus. So I'm sure this clearly reflects the mind of our Lord, which is for us to, to reflect at all times. So our Lord Jesus Christ kept focus in all his life. Now thinking about our Lord and his mind is a matter of false accusation. Maybe the best test for us and how we react and think about maybe pride is how we react to false accusation. If we react badly, it is because our pride is good. Now the accusation Jesus had to face were false. And he practiced what he preached. He told his disciples, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And that, brothers and sisters, is why we read, <clears throat> let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now we as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have put on Christ in our baptism. So let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, to the glory of the Father. And this, brothers and sisters, will leave no place for any pride. 